My name is Travis Bickford. Uh, I spell T R A V is in Victor, I S B is in Bravo, I C K F O R D. Your birthday? May 13th, 1981. The names of the people that you need to interview are Lovely Damari, Tunia, and Denise. What war branch did you serve in? I served in the Army. And you say what war branch, mm -hmm. correct? And I served, uh, the war I served in was um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, so in, in Iraq, the Iraq War. What was your rank? Um, I got out as a, um, I was actually just about get to be promoted to staff sergeant, but I, I, I left as a E5 buck sergeant just because I didn't want to stay in. Um, what is an E5? Um, so there's a, you have two different rank structures, well three different rank structures, but the two most common are the officer ranks and the enlisted, and enlisted is um, what I was in. So that's like the non-commissioned officer as opposed to being a commissioned officer. So you say E5 because each rank has a number attached to it. So sergeant is an E5, right? Staff sergeant, E6. Sergeant first class, E7. So you see the E stands for enlisted and then the number goes up. And so there's, so there's you have the E for enlisted, the number, and then the rank, the actual physical name of the rank. <clears throat> Your normal voice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what did you serve? What did I serve? Where did you serve? Where did I serve? I served in, um, I served, you know, for more than, for multiple months or, or more at a time. I served in Georgia, um, Germany. I served in Maine, and I served in Baghdad. I also spent a month in Vermont. Um, I spent six weeks in Belgium. And I spent a month in Colorado. Did you like going to all those different places? Yeah, that was. I would say that was um, probably one of my one of, one of my favorite things about the army was the fact that um, I, I traveled so much as a result of my of, of my experience in the in the army. Um, every new place I went to, I enjoyed. Some of those places, you know, I didn't really get to see as much as I would have liked to, just because. Um, of the nature of my job and, and the uh, how much work was you know and necessitated, um, but overall, yeah, I was I liked seeing all those places. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Wow. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I grew up in a I was in a real small town in northern Maine. Um, you know there wasn't a lot of opportunity up there. Uh, you know, I don't think I had really done what I needed to do in high school to prepare myself for college, nor had anybody in my family gone to college. So it just seemed that whole, that idea just seemed like kind of pretty foreign to me at, the point, at that time in my life. Like, didn't really seem like college was an option. Um, and, and there was no other way out of my town. You know, I didn't have any money or anything like that. So. I just knew, you know, I was living with my grandmother, like, at the time. Like, I just knew, like, I needed to do something, and I needed to start getting on my own. So I felt like this would be a, a, a good step into that direction. Like, this, this might help me be able to accomplish that, get on my own, and, and do what I need to do. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So why did you pick the service branch where you belong? I had a lot of family members who had been in the Army. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of my family. I had a rich, rich history of, 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 of uh, army in my family. So to me, it just didn't seem like there was any other branch. Um, you know, I chose, enlist, I chose infantry um, within, within the army because at the time it was a short enlistment. I didn't have to sign up for as many years to go infantry. It wasn't because I wanted to be bad and like, you know, be combat and be on the ground. I, mean, I just really, I actually would have, they wanted me to go intel, but um, it was a longer commitment for active duty that I didn't want to commit to. I signed up in 98, you know, so it wasn't like, you know, when you, when you signed up back then, if you signed up for two, three, four, five, six years, that's what you did. 
you didn't have to worry about getting called up or getting activated or whatever, right? Because things, you, that just didn't happen back then. So I wanted the shortest amount of time just as in case I didn't like it. I wanted to have that option to do something else. So you recall your first day in service? Yeah, I mean, you know, first days, I mean, it's like, it's such a whirlwind. I mean, like, you know, it's, I mean, it's like, it's like getting just, it's like getting picked up and put into the, to a tornado, right? Like, you just spin and you don't know where you're going to go, right? Everything seems like it's really fast and destructive because you're like, you know, everyone's yelling at, I mean, it's chaos. Like, yeah, it's, it's, <clears throat> you know, I guess maybe analogous to that, but like, you know, you're like, I just remember, I mean, there's no sleep. You get off, you know, it was my first plane ride. I'd never been on a plane before. So I'm like, well, this is great. You know, my first plane ride to this place called Boot Camp, which you only hear nightmare stories about. So, you know, I'm going to boot camp. I get there and it's just, you know, I mean, right off the bus, like you're getting yelled at, you know, you're doing this, you're doing that, no sleep. It's just go, 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 go. They're trying to really put a lot of pressure on you early on. Just probably maybe to just, try to get used to a shocky a little bit, but also so that way uh, um, prepare you for what's going to be coming forward. Do you remember like any specific boot camp training experience? Yeah, I mean, there was a couple. I mean, boot camp was fun. Um, you know, I went to, uh, I was a, um, I was a pretty, pretty good cross country runner in high school. So I, uh, I was state runner up um, in Maine. And, um, you know, so when I went to basic training, I, I was, most people who ran at the, at the level or as fast as I did were running at big colleges. Um, I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't academically eligible to run in college. I couldn't play um, at the Division One level, any sport until for, for a minimum of a year because of my grades and my, um, so I, uh, I remember like I, I stuck out because I would win the, like any kind of any running thing that we did, I'd be so far ahead of everybody. So I eventually nicknamed, I got a nickname that, that private who could run. Where's that private that can run? Where is he? Where is he? Where's that private that can run? You know, so I'd always have to run up here. here I am just on. But uh, we had a, this one brigade run. It was about 5,000 soldiers and all the drill sergeants in the whole brigade. Um, and they did a, they called it a 5K fun run, even though there's no such thing as a fun run. Um, but uh, oxymoron. But anyways, so we all went and we did this run. Um, it was mandatory, you know, and I, I won the, I won it. I came in first and no one like that, like looked really good for my company. So um, all of a sudden, like they were like, I was getting donuts when no one else could for a bit. Um, they gave me, you know, we weren't allowed to use the phone, except, like very limited phone use. So you had very, only during basic training, like during boot camp and basic training, but like, you know, it was like maybe five, 10 minutes a week if you were lucky. Well, I got unlimited phone use from the end of training to the, to the lights out. So like people would like, you know, cause that was like unheard of. Like I could call as much as I wanted to when we we're done training. And people would be like, I was like, before I know I'm calling everyone's wife, everyone's parents. Hey, this is uh, Private Bigford. I'm serving with your husband out here in, in, in Fort Benning. He just wants you to say, he wants like, me to tell you that he loves you and can you send him some Mach 3 razors? <laughs> you know, because like I had, you know, that phone, I mean, it's crazy, you know, you lose your phone privileges, like, you know, and then all of a sudden, like someone has them, like, you know, you could, I mean, that's a quick way, that's a quick form of communication rather than having to wait for two letters exchange, you know? <clears throat> so, I, mean, I got to know everyone's family. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that was funny, but yeah. So do you remember yeah, yeah, I mean, I do. Um, I had some good, I had some really good ones. I had one guy who was kind of a, I don't know, kind of a blowhard, but um, for the most part, you know, they were, they were pretty, pretty straight up. Um, one guy, you know, he, he really messed with me at first, but him and I, you know, he wrote me, which I don't think happens a lot. Like, he wrote me letters. Um, afterwards, he, uh, he got me set up for a tryout for the All Army track team, which I declined because uh, that was in Colorado and I guess sent to Germany. And I thought Germany was cooler than Colorado. <laughs> so I decided to stay in Germany, but he got that all set up for me and everything. So. So how did you get through like, his training for him? 
and just one day at a time. You know, that's all it is. Like, you know, at the end, you just got to keep perspective. I mean, it's like, you know, you look at so many people before you have done this, and it's like, it's not going to kill you. You know what I mean? I mean, the training part, right? I don't know. But when you're training, like, that's how I got through, like, any difficult school that I went to, you know, whether it be Belgian Commando or, like, whatever, like, Mountain Warfare, anything like that. Like, it's just one day at a time. Like, you're going to be all right. Which wars did you serve again? I saw spot in Rock, Baghdad. Do you remember arriving and what was it like? Uh, it was hot. It was 128 degrees that day. Kuwait. Show Kuwait first. You go Kuwait to uh, from Kuwait to the Rock, but spent you spent about a week in Kuwait acclimating, getting used to the heat. Um, you know, so you know you don't want to just get thrown out in combat, right? With you know 125 full battle rattle. And you know, you're not used to it, so you know they try to set you up. But um, it was 120 degrees. It was a really hot day out. It was first week of August, um, and I remember just drinking as much water as I could. And uh, I remember I'd said there was a duty where we had to move all the duffel bags from everybody. Hundreds of duffel bags, right? Um, big duffel bags, heavy with all the gear and equipment in it, and. Uh, I was a squad leader, so I, was, I, had, like eight, I had a squad of um, eight other soldiers uh, that worked below me. And I had said if we, we were doing like squad competitions while we were training, I said if we won a competition, like if we won a certain competition, like and the first three duties that were asked on us, I would, I would volunteer myself instead of what you don't normally do as a squad leader. Like that's what you got your guys for. And uh, that first one was, you know, in 128 degree heat, moving like hundreds upon hundreds of real heavy duffel bags. <laughs> I mean, I just remember, I was like, I looked like I fell in a lake, you know, but, uh, but yeah, that was day one. Did you see combat? Yep. Could you tell me about it? Yeah, sure. I mean, I saw, you know, I mean, there was, um, there's different, I feel like, different levels of, I mean, combat isn't, you know, can't really be, it's, it's a very, broad word, right? Like, I mean, it, it, combat can be defined in a lot of different ways. Um, you have combat where, you know, sometimes you get mortars coming in. You know, I remember my, there was multiple occasions of that. Um, you know, I mean, those are scary. Like, I mean, to be honest, I'd rather get shot at than like a mortar come in and me not being able to see it. Um, I remember just like my, my first week there, I'm sitting there, you know, it just seems like, like when you're on base, like you know, it just seems like you're in your like safe little world. Like you're walking around, you don't have your gear on, you're wearing like your PT shorts and your army t-shirt and flip flops or whatever. And then all of a sudden, like you just get reminded, like that, like oh yeah, I'm in a war zone. So I remember like my first week, I'm outside, I'm getting ready to go to work, and I'm like smoking a cigarette with my buddy, and uh, all of a sudden. We hear this zzz, like that, and a rocket just comes blazing in, goes through someone's trailer, right? Because we have all these little trailers set up out there. Goes, rips through someone's trailer and just skips down, like basically like a path, you know, like the little roads that we had in between the trailers um, where we lived, like our barracks kind of. Um, just zip down and go right by us, and we're like, holy shit, like, did that really just happen? <laughs> you know, we're like, it just didn't detonate. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, did, it was a dud, like, it, it, but it still came through, and you're just like, oh, man. Uh, there was another time, um, you know, I remember, these are the, just on base, I remember one time I was sitting there, woke up in the morning, and, you know, I smoked a lot when I was in the Army. I mean, that's just what soldiers do, right? So, you know, you wake up, you go through your habits, so first thing I'm doing, like, I get up, um, I light a cigarette. And, then, and at this point, my roommate and I are just kind of over it. We're like, whatever, we're in, we're in Iraq. So we're at this point, we're, we've gone beyond going outside. We're smoking in our room. And uh, I just wake up, and all of a sudden, you hear like a real, like a, a mortar coming in. So rockets and mortars sound a little different. And this mortar comes in, and it is loud. It sounds like a plane taking off. But like, imagine, you know, like that noise, like you know, when you hear a plane, like a plane taking off, like from the engines. From, um, Imagine that, but like you're standing right next to it. And, but you know it's not a plane, right? You know it's, you know it's a mortar. And it like, it's so loud, like you think it's gotta be hitting you. Like, and, but you can't see it. Like when you can see a mortar, you're like, oh, that's not too, you know, you know to get down, but like you can at least, you know it's not like, when you're in your room, you're like, oh man, that thing's hitting me, hit 100 yards past me. That's not that far. 
you know what I mean? But like, um, and then there was just, you know, on, on mission, like, you know, on duty, like there was just a lot of like firefights, stuff like that. Um, I mean, not a lot of them. There's not, it's not like what you see in like the films and the news and all that, but it happens. Um, my first one, I was eating, I was eating. Like literally, I was just eating, like I was eating a cheeseburger. Um, I was on a sniper tower, um, kind of like a sitting duck. And this is the one that I got my CIB for. Uh, and all of a sudden, it was a combat infantry badge, we can talk about that later, but like, all of a sudden just, just get opened up on, right? Like just, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm getting shot, <laughs> you know, so like my cheeseburger, like literally I jump up, like cheeseburger and everything flies, you know, in the air. I'm like, I don't have my helmet on because I, I hate wearing a helmet. I just always did. And uh, I always, always got in trouble for not wearing my helmet. So I'm like, well, I need it now. So I'm like, where? So I, you know, I grab my helmet, put it on, and you know, I just get on the gun and like uh, engage back and forth. Um, but uh, that was that. And then, you know, there was a couple guys, like one guy got shot like 60 feet behind me. Um, but he was okay, it was in the leg. Um, and, you know, there was just other times, like, where you'd get, like, occasionally shot at or, like, you know, explosions go off right next to you or, you know, stuff like that. So that's to me. So, like, you see what I mean? Like, combat isn't, I think, what everyone thinks it is, is in the traditional sense. It's, it's more of a broad term. Were there many casualties in the unit? Um, yeah, so the it depends. So I left... Um, I. I didn't, I didn't deploy with my original unit, the unit that I'd been serving with for the past few years. Um, I, got, uh, I got activated. Uh, I, my two best friends got activated, so I volunteered to go over with them. So I left, I, I left my unit. So that, um, <clears throat> the unit that I was over there with, we didn't take any casualties, but two weeks before I left, my, my original unit came in and we took, we took three from that unit. So, I mean, I lost in total probably five good friends, you know, over there. Uh, two guys that I served directly with for a long time. But, yeah. Just use your hand, because I'm 18. Oh, okay. Can you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences? Yeah, um, I mean, it's been, like back then, uh, you know, one of the things was like, was when I, when I volunteered to go, um, you know, so I, I signed up, I was like, standard, you know, 17 years old when I signed up, I was, you know, poor rural kid, whatever, right, you know, fast forward seven years later, right, I'm still in, <laughs> you know, never thought that would happen. Um, I'm like, you know, one day I get a, I get a phone call and, you know, my best friend from the, uh, from the Army, from back when I was serving in Germany, back I met him when I was 18, you know, this is six years later at that point from when I met him, and he got out, we got off active duty and joined the National Guard, and that's a whole other story for another day, I shouldn't have done that, but I did. Um, and um, he moves to Maine with me even though he's from Florida, like, he's my boy. Like, he's like, hey, I, you know, I got out a little bit before him. He's like, is it cool, you know? I mean, I think sometimes, like, you get so used to each other, like, soldiers, it's hard to readjust, so it's, it's easier to do it around each other. So he's like, can I move up to Maine, you know, and, like, you know, try to go to UMaine with you? I'm like, yeah, dude, definitely, you know? So he comes out, moves up with me, and, uh, and we're obviously just really close, right? And one day I'm sitting there, and I'm at our, all, we, now we, like, our whole circle of friends is just, you know, together, right? Um, and, you know, so I'm like <clears throat> sitting there hanging out and all of a sudden Adam's not with me. He almost always is. That's the guy, right? And I get a phone call and it's like we're looking for Moskovitz and I'm like, oh man, like, great, you know. I'm, I'm, so I know he's getting activated. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to volunteer, you know. And my, cat, my commander's like, no, 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 you got to sleep on it. And I'm like, you know, the only reason why he's in the main National Guard is because of me, you know. And I'm like, all right, I'll sleep on it. So what's interesting about this story is, is the next day, Ab and I, regardless, um, independent of this whole phone call I got, had already had plans to go to California, right? And the reason why we were going to California was because um, Adam, 
my, my best friend, uh, his little brother was a really intelligent kid, had, had attended Harvard, and had, was roommates with Mark Zuckerberg, and had started Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg. So his little brother is the co-founder of Facebook. Um, and Mark Zuckerberg and his little brother are flying Adam and I out to Facebook. It's like to the comp, like, like we're gonna stay at their house. They were all living together then. Um, you know, Sean Parker, all them. And they're flying us out. So you think about that decade, right? From 2000, this is 2005, right? Smack in the middle of that decade. You think of the decade 2000 to 2010, you know, two probably, I can't say it's what absolutely shaped that decade, but when you think of two major events that shaped that decade, you think of Facebook and you think of those wars, right? And I'm sitting there, I take, my CEO tells me I have to sleep on it. So I'm on, I'm on my way to Zuckerberg's house, right? I'm going to go check out Facebook with uh, Adam's little brother. And they're, you know, they're flying us out. I'm at Detroit on a layover and I call and volunteer to, 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 to go to Iraq. So like I'm volunteering to go to the war on my way to you know, go stay at the Facebook house, right? You know, so it was just kind of looking back. You know, I, I don't think at the time I under, quite understood like the magnitude or how kind of unique that, that, that whole experience was. I mean, I was just like, I was 24 years old. I was like, whatever, this is, you know, I didn't even care. Like I was like, you know, I just didn't, I wasn't thinking on those levels. So I was just gun ho do whatever, you know. But I look back on it now, I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind, of, kind, of, kind of funny. But. Why you award in um, Yeah, so I got six Army Achievement Awards. Um, I got an ARCOM. Um, I got a Combat Infantry Badge. Um, and then, I mean, I have a bunch of other ones too, but they're not important. But, um, but yeah, six, six AMs is a lot. Like, I don't know if too many people have that many, but. Um, yeah, I went to some schools, things like that, but yeah. I got a commando, I got a foreign, foreign, uh, foreign military commando patch uh, for going through a foreign military commando program. Um, so how did you get the comments? Um, no, you, how did I get my medals? Yeah. I mean, all kinds of different things. So like I was, uh, when I was in the National Guard, I got the whole Northeast region, which is like from Maryland to Maine. Um, soldier of the Year. Uh, I, I got activated for a year uh, in Maine, and I stayed on um, whatever. I got it for a bunch of stupid things. I got the ARCOM for uh, uh, for being the primary instructor of 21 Ugandans for my last six weeks in Iraq. Um, I was training Ugandan civilians to um, maintain perimeter security for the base. <clears throat> uh, how did you stay in touch with your family? And we had internet and phone. Like, I mean, just like anybody else stays in touch with their family. You know, it's 2000, 2000s, right? Like, so we had, we had these little track phones, some of expensive, but you're not spending your money on anything else. You know, it's not like you're going to the club or anything. So, I mean, you know, like you have a lot of more, you have a lot of money to save. So you buy phone cards, internet, IM, Facebook, email, same thing. And what was the food like? It's pretty good. Um, you know, we, I, I was on Camp Victory. It was the biggest, biggest base in, in Iraq at the time. Um, Camp Victory and Liberty, you know, the compound. Um, they call it, like, it's right next to the green zone. And it was, I mean, Baghdad was, was happening right then. That was during, you know, right, right during smack in the middle of the mosque, getting blown up, um, which was known to be the bloodiest time period and the bloodiest, you know, in Iraq, um, because the Shiites, the Sunni Shiite, you know, conflict there. Um, the Shiites started becoming aggressive, which they hadn't done yet. But my base was big, chill. You know, I mean, we had we had a really nice, really nice chow hall. I mean, can't complain. Um, your time there, did you feel any pressure or stress? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I'm usually pretty good with that kind of stuff. I think, like, um, you know. I don't, I don't typically get really stressed out easily. I mean, I don't know, maybe I do, but I don't think I do. But uh, yeah, I mean, there was definitely, yeah, I mean, there was definitely moments. I mean, there were moments over there when I did things that I, you know, I acted in, in ways that I never had before or after. 
Um, <coughs> and it was, you know, I look back, reflecting back. And at the time, I still thought I was, I think maybe even maybe I was relatively or comparably speaking, still uh, pretty, pretty with it, you know. But I look back and reflect, I'm like, I can't believe I did something like that, you know. Like, I would get in, like, fist fights with guys, you know, like, um, things like that. Stuff I don't do, you know. Like, I'm like, you know, like, whatever. Like, you just, you know, I realized, I was like, well, that was a really stressful time. Like, they, like, I mean, I guess I'm not trying to justify any action, but at least I can understand where it came from, you know. So I just remember, but yeah, yeah, you're under stress, and, like, you just, you always want to go home, right? Like. You always want to go home. Like you're always thinking about going home, man. You know, sometimes the time just seems like it's never gonna go by. But yeah. What are things that you did for your life? Nothing that really sticks out. Oh yeah, I had this like little thing that I always carried, a little angel thing that someone gave me. Um, I'm not like super religious, but. Um, Oh yeah, I had this like little, um, like little pewter, you know, like pewter's a form, like an alloy kind of metal. It's like a little malleable, like move, you know, bends easily. Um, like angel thing, and like, I mean, I'm not like the most religious guy out there, but for some reason, whenever I was in the military, I always went to church. Um, they always say there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. Um, I figured it couldn't hurt, <laughs> you know, like wasn't gonna hurt anything, so I always kept that with me right there. Yeah, foxholes, I mean, we don't really use them too much anymore, but foxholes, like when you dig in, like dig a big hole, so that way um, when you're fighting, you know, when you're shooting, right, like one, you want to have cover. Like you want to have as, you know, um, you want to minimize your target to the enemy, you know, so one way to do that is to dig in the ground, so just so you can just shoot up above like that and then you're covered in the ground, right? Um, and you can duck in when you need to. So. That's the beauty of it. But also the, the benefits of a foxhole too is that you can, you know, when you're shooting, right, um, you know, your skeleton system, right, your skeletal, your bones as your best support, right, uh, or the ground, anything that's steady, you know, but you want to be able to move too when you're shooting at a foxhole. So you can, you can it's, it's dug up high enough right here so you can push your, put your elbows up and you can really, you know, shoot accurately and what have you. So. <clears throat> You know, I mean, like, I'll be honest with you, like, we'd, I'd get, you know, we'd get alcohol sent to us. Um, you know, you get a orange, take an orange Listerine bottle that big, because it's illegal to drink over there um, for soldiers. So you get, like, these orange Listerine bottles, and it kind of looks like whiskey. So you dump it out, have whiskey filled in, get them sent to you in care packages. I mean, I'm not, someone must have thought I had a really clean mouth. Um, but, you know, I mean... But uh, you know, get you know, so you do that like when you can. Um, played a lot of poker, uh, barbecued a lot. We could go down the PX and get meat. Um, you know, play baseball, like throw a baseball around, gloves, basketball, football. You know, any you know, like whatever you know, what any what anybody would do. You know, if you were out there. But uh, you just you know, we did like me and my me and my friends really 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 made a solid effort. Like we didn't want to be those guys who sat in their room and just played video because you could play video games out there. Like you have all that stuff sat and get TVs in your room, and like we just did not want to be those guys. Like we wanted to like always make sure we were doing pushing the limits of what we could do over there given the parameters we had to work in. So you know like we we bought like bikes you know and we drove I mean we were like reverting back to like being kids you know because like what else are you gonna do like you're on this base with a bunch of other you know people mostly dudes you know and like you're just like like who cares so like we like, ride around these bikes we pretended like that we were in a biker gang you know and like, and, like we would uh, we would just you know try to go as far as we could you know on those and like we would um, any like all the other bases that we could get access to we would get to we would like. Bum a Humvee or someone and go check them out. There was a pool that the Australians ran because we overtook one of Saddam's palaces. So he had an outdoor pool. It was a hike away, you know, but like that was like the closest thing we could get to like being home, you know, it was like this, we could put on like, like girls could wear bathing suits, you know, there. And like, I mean, that was crazy, you know, seeing someone in a bathing suit. So we we're like, um, you know, it was just like, it felt like that was like, that was this little, 
you know, bubble of, of like, you know, not there, <laughs> right? I guess to put it in simple terms. So we, we just, you know, we were really, really um, outgoing with that stuff. But in the, in the wintertime, man, there's like a rainy period in Baghdad and it rains, like, it's no joke. I mean, it comes down and the water table size, it was just mud. I mean, like, you know, you can't, it, you can't escape it. I mean, so that's really depressing. Uh, you go outside and like, you try to walk around, like you're in like mud up to here, you know, you lose your boots. Like, you know, so you're just like, you just, during those two months, it gets pretty depressing. I think those were the toughest two months. You just stay inside because the mud, you, the mud's in, there's no asphalt. Like we're not riding the asphalt. So it's like, you can't escape it. It gets everywhere. It's on everything. But, uh, yeah. But that, like, entertainment ever sent in? Hmm? Did you guys get entertainment sent in? Like, the end? Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, I was infantry. Like, I didn't have time to go to that. I mean, that's the thing, man. Like, everyone, like, the guys who are, like, really, all, the military is, like, very small percentage of its combat, right? Mm -hmm. The majority of its support, you know? But all you all see the movies about everything's combat, so you th everyone thinks the whole military's combat. Whenever like you get like USO or like entertainers and stuff in, the combat guys rarely ever get to see that stuff. I never got to see any of that. Like that was like I wouldn't even hear about it because like our commanding wouldn't even tell us because they didn't even want us to know what we're missing out on. So sometimes I wouldn't find out that there was like some country singer or somebody coming in until like the last minute because, you know, like we had time off, but I work nights. Someone has to be out there doing stuff at night. So like. All those events happened at night, you know, and like I didn't get a lot of days off, so I'm like, you know, I never, I never saw one. I saw a senator speak on Thanksgiving. That's it. <clears throat> what did you do when on leave? I never took leave. Um, I uh, gave it to my trip, one of my soldiers, so Why? because he earned it. Um, where did you travel last time? Um, I traveled to Georgia. Um, I mean, I traveled all over Europe when I was stationed in Europe. Um, you know, I traveled. Um, I went to Kuwait and, and Iraq, Colorado, Vermont, Georgia twice, Maine. I spent six weeks in Belgium um, with their military. So. Do you recall any particular humorous or unusual events? Unusual events? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I. Yeah, like when I first showed up to Iraq, it was pretty crazy because I think mean, I, I think I spoke to the program about this before, but um, it's one of the definitely one of the memories that sticks out the most. And it was uh, um, I showed up about a month later. Hurricane Katrina hit uh, the U.S. And um, my brigade was, was run by a National Guard. My base I was on was run by, being, op being ran, you know, operated by a National Guard brigade that was based out of Louisiana. Um, first time a National Guard brigade had ever run a forward operating base in theater in, in combat. Um, and it just happened to be from Louisiana. Most of the guys were from New Orleans. So you imagine like, you got these guys and girls, women, you know, guys and men and women who had been over there for who knows, you know, 18, I think they're up, coming up on 18 months. And they're just, you know, 18 months over there. Like, it's hard for anybody who's never been there has to understand, like, how, how long that is in, in civilian years. It's like, it's like the difference between a way we age and dogs age. You know what I mean? Like, it's like seven years in civilian years. You know what I mean? And... And these guys are ready, you know, these women are ready to go home. And all of a sudden, Katrina hits their hometown. And now, like, they don't know if their family's alive. You know, they don't know if they have a house to go home to. I mean, it was like some, some of these people didn't, didn't find out about their families for weeks after. And, like, you know, when you, when you think about, like, your families are supposed to be worried about you, you know, when you're in combat. You're not supposed to be worried about your families. So I remember just, it was like such an eerie feeling walking around base, you know, like for the first time, like, you know, like, like no one felt bad about any, like we didn't feel bad about ourselves for being over there, like, you know, like, or anything like that. Like you felt bad about them 
and their families and the people over there, you know, Katrina. So it was just a weird kind of, it was just kind of strange. It was a weird way to think about it, you know, and, and I felt so, I've never felt so bad for people in my life as I did walk around that base and just like knowing like, you know, I mean, this person's leaving combat to go to something even worse. And it was just, yeah, so that, that really stuck out. <clears throat> it was also probably one of the most untold stories of the, of the Iraq War that people don't realize that the reason why a lot of people didn't get the attention they got in New Orleans was because their National Guard was in Iraq. <clears throat> I mean, you know, you're, there's, I mean, every day, I mean, everything's a prank over there. I mean, you're always doing something. I mean, you know, like, some of the stuff, and I know, I mean, some of the stuff I can't, I can't talk about, but, like, um, you know, there's always, like, you know, messing with guy's gear or, like, you know, like, taking, like, a new private who just came in and, like, sending them down to go pick up a box of grid squares. Grid squares are, like, what's on a map. Like, they don't come in boxes, they're on a map. A grid squares are like a map. It's like a thousand, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, a thousand meters by a thousand meters, right? I mean, they don't sell them. We're like telling them to go, uh, to go, to jump on a, on a, on a 20 ton tank or, or 60 ton tank and check for the, um, see if the shocks are okay. Could you imagine someone 175 pounds jumping on something that weighs 60 tons? You think it's going to make a difference, you know what I mean? But they'll do it because they don't think, you know, and they'll do anything you're told. So I think that's the funniest thing. Uh, we, um, I, we, I had a soldier who, uh, who screwed up one time. Like, he left us. So, like, we, uh, me and my team leader, who, man, I talked to him, like, just, I don't know, weekly basis. He was my roommate over there. So team leader, I had two sergeants that worked below me. But one of them was my best friend who I volunteered to go for, and the other one's also one of my best friends. Um, so even though they were below me, they're still, we're all tight. And uh, um, one of our soldiers like screwed up and like didn't report to us, tell us where we were going, that we had to be accountable for everybody. And this is before we left. So we, uh, we made him walk around with a big rock that he had tied to himself like this. And anytime anybody asked him what it was, why he was carrying around a rock, he had to say, this is my emotional baggage for leaving my team and team leader and squad leader behind for the enemy to kill. <laughs> and, like, and it's like, you know, you look back on it, it's like, that's messed up, right? But like, I mean, he got a kick out. Like we all laugh, I mean, that's just the culture. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, it's not like I would ever do that to like one of my students that I taught, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, you know, I'm, if anything, I'm a softy, you know, but like, um, it's just, it's hard to, it's hard to understand. Like, that's just the culture. But, you know, we, we got such a kick out of it. We'd be like, you know, Stranero, we, we'd go around telling people at, to, we called him Stereo. Everyone's got a nickname in the army, you know? So this guy's name was Stranero, but we called him Stereo. And we'd be like, we'd be like, any soldier we see be like, go ask Stereo why he's got that rock. You know? So we'd get a kick out of him after to explain it. But, you know, things like that. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I could, God. Yeah, we're always doing something. I don't know. I mean, it's it's pretty funny. Do you have any photographs? I didn't bring them today, but I got a bunch. Yeah, I lost some recently, but my friends got a bunch of them. Um, but yeah, you know, got a lot of got a lot of pics. There's none today. Why? Why? Who are some people in the photographs? Um, you know, some of my fellow soldiers. You know, uh, there are me, you know, me, my two best friends over there. We call ourselves, like, like you, you guys had a tripod. <laughs> um, let's see, there's uh, a lot of pictures of locals, things like that. Um, I was always, like, I was really, really interested with the, the culture over there. And so I would always, I tried to capture that to the best of my ability with a camera. Um, I ended up just going back and living over there as a civilian um, in the Middle East a few years ago, so a few years later. Um, but yeah. Did you keep a personal diary? Nah. It's all here. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was in college, and I was finishing up 
<clears throat> my last semester of college. Um, and like my roommates all threw a party for me. Like a probably like a surprise party. They didn't tell me they were gonna do it, but yeah. Was your education supported by the VI? Yes and no. I mean, it was supported. Um, you know, it didn't, it definitely didn't pay for all of it. I mean, I signed up for 98, so my GI Bill was small. So, and I signed up for a short enlistment because I thought I was only going to be a couple of years. I didn't realize I was going to get activated so much more. So, um, you know, hindsight's obviously 2020. I mean, if I don't know. If I had to sign up for the military, I mean, I would have just done like the whole shebang and gotten a much larger bonus and bigger GI Bill. But I only got like, I started out getting just under 900 a month, um, which, you know, didn't pay for a lot, didn't touch tuition. So I either had to make a decision to work full time or close to full time because I was totally on my own. Um, you know, either way, there's just all these different expenses. So I basically, um, I had $900, which was based, you know, chipped away at what I needed. To, to survive and pay for college. It helped though, it definitely helped, but it just, it wasn't like what a lot of these soldiers are getting these days. Um, you know, it didn't, didn't cover a lot. I have a, I have a decent amount of student loan debt, just like a lot of other people. Did you make any close friendships while in the service? Yeah, 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 I mean, I'm, just, just like I said, I still talk to them. Uh, the best man in one guy's wedding uh, in July. Um, you know, like I said, some of these guys call me on a weekly basis. You know, one of them asked me to, one of them decided to become an officer, and I pinned his rank on him for the first time, so that commissioned him. Like, he asked me to do that, um, you know, which was an honor. I mean, that was a big honor. So, yeah, I mean, I'm still close to them, yeah. Did you join any organization? Yeah, I, I stayed away from it. Like, I was so over it. You know, like I, for years, I didn't want anything to do with this topic. Like I, I, you know, like I, I didn't read, I just, I read my first book about the military about a year and a half ago. I'd never touched any literature. I just started watching the movies. Um, you know, I was, I didn't want to be around other veterans. Like I was just sick of it, except for there's a few of my friends, you know, like I had a select few of like good friends, but like other than that, like I didn't want to be around a bunch of other vets. So I stayed like really far, like I just, I was like, I'm, uh, I'm over it, like, like I need a break from that. And it's not because like I have anything against it, I was just like, needed a break. And like, I'm like, you know, pretty liberal, pretty liberally minded, like I, I you know, oppose the war, I've always, like, I don't think I fit into that, um, to that, to that mold, you know, to the stereotype that a lot of people have. So, um, it, and I think I am a little anomalous, I've been a little, um, a little different than you know some of the people I served with so for me I, I didn't feel like at the time that they were like-minded individuals so I just didn't feel like being around them um, I've since disabused myself of that I've, I've convinced myself I've, I've come to realize that that's not true right and you know now I in Chicago especially since I've been spending time out here I've been really connected to just a great group of veterans like we um we do this thing called Happy Hour Heroes, where we go and meet um, after work once a month. We do a breakfast, and we and it's like veterans who are working to, you know, uh, with, you know, who are interested in helping other veterans out or in some in any kind of capacity, in any way. And we talk, we brainstorm, we think of like different things that could happen in the city differently. Um, some of them are working directly with organizations. Um, we volunteer for each other, you know, like we do things like that, and it's it's like I. I was wrong. There were a lot of like-minded individuals, and maybe I was the one that was too narrow-minded to open up to it when I was in. So now I am. Now I'm much more involved. Is there anything you would like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? We're good. All right. Well, thank you. You're welcome.